Well, I hope not. <laughs>
Romans 12, 2. Okay.
week. Say amen. 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 As uh, the Lord has blessed us, it's an opportunity for us to uh, give back to Him. And uh, so as we come for a time of offering this morning, uh, we're going to ask uh, Brother Noah to lead us in prayer, please. Go back 
to that old time religion and the hearts and churches and the hearts of people in the churches then would be on fire today like that. How many would you like to see that? Um, I did there. I've never experienced that. Now I've experienced revival within uh, in churches, uh, but I think it's just a small magnitude of what it was then, back in the reading in the days of the Great Awakening and things of that nature, and how people their desire in their hearts was to follow after the Lord and not to follow after the world. And so uh, let's pray that our church here at Gethsemane. Uh, would send people that would want to do that. Even if our own hearts here would want to do that. And that our main focus would be on the Lord and His kingdom and His work and not the desires of the world. And so uh, we, uh, we're we going to continue in the book of John this morning. But uh, we're going to fast forward a couple verses because we're coming up on Easter next weekend. And so I invite all of you to come back and join us. We're having a great time next week. We have things for the kids Next week, uh, we also uh, have some special music next week as well. And then we're also having an Easter lunch following the services. And so uh, I want you all to come and be a part of that and come and join us here at Gethsemane as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about Easter. It's not about bunnies. And it's not about eggs. How many of you agree with that? Amen. It's about our Lord and what he has done as He is raised from the dead. He is living and He is a true living God. He is not some fake God or a fake God. He is a living God. And praise the Lord for that. And so we come to celebrate that next week. And as we celebrate that next week, we're going to look at verses in the chapter 19 today that are going to lead into next week into chapter 20. And hopefully, you're going to have to listen fast this morning because it looks like according to that clock, I only got 40 minutes to get the message in. So, you guys know how long-winded I am. I'm going to see if I can get it in with that time frame, okay? And so, no amens from the front there, all right? <laughs> and so, let's look at chapter 19. Jordan, could you turn the mic down just a little bit in the back? I think it's a little loud. But uh, And so, let's get into the verses. And before we get into the verses this morning, let us pray and give this time to the Lord. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for those disciples such as John, uh, Lord, that was so faithful and true and, and was a perfect witness for us to even follow today, Father. Father, I pray that as we read the word today that we would have our minds and hearts open to hear what you have to say to us today. We thank you for our guests that are here today. May they receive a blessing for being here today. Lord, we're so grateful and thank you for sending them our way, Father. May they find a blessing and want to return and be a part of our services and be a part of the work here that we have set before us here at the Seminary Missionary Baptist Church, Father. Father, we just love you. Let our lives and our hearts desire show it each day as we walk according to your wills and way. Lord, be with the services, be with the words I say. Lord, that the words that will come out of my mouth, not of my own desires, but of you. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity it is to stand before your people and bring your message, Father. Lord, just be with us now. Watch over us. And protect us in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we look into uh, chapter 19 here, we see that as we are familiar with the book of John, that Rome here, during the time of the Roman Empire, it was a picture of justice. A world for justice. They were all about justice. If something happened and was done wrong according to the law, they wanted justice to be taken care of. And so we see that even they had their own pictures of that. The Roman uh, leaders at that time, they had a statue that sat on their desk that reminded them of that. Uh, the statue's name was Janus. It was two-faced, okay? It had a one looked forward and uh, one looked back. And as we look at that, we see that we get the month of January from that statue called Janus. Janus in January, we're looking forward to a new year, and then we're also looking back to the previous year before. And so that was some interesting notes that I thought I'd share with you this morning that I uh, came across as I was studying for the lesson today. And so it reminded the Roman soldiers, the Roman leaders uh, of both sides, okay? It reminded them that they have innocent, and then you also have guilty. You are innocent until proven guilty according to what the law tells us, right? And so we're going to see today that that picture of that illustration was not, uh, was not applied to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that even through this that the trial of Christ was a great 
miscarried or misrepresentation of this justice. And so let's get into the verses here. It says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of Jews. And they smote him with their, their hands. As we know, and we know uh, we're very familiar with the Bible, we see that Jesus was brought before Pilate. And when we go through chapter 18, We'll look more into that. But we see here that he was brought before Pilate. The religious leaders and uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees of that time had uh, sought to kill Jesus. And here it was a time at hand. Other times before, Christ kept saying, it's not my time. It's not my time. But here we see it was a time at hand for him to face the cross at Calvary. And so Jesus was brought before Pilate and where they accused him of what? of being the Son of God. He was blasphemy, they thought. But what Jesus was telling them was exactly the truth. And so as Jesus was brought before Pilate, Pilate didn't want anything to do with this situation. He kept telling them over and over that I found no fault in this man. I have found nothing wrong that this man has done. And so to please the people, uh, we see that Pilate had him scorned had him uh, beaten, thinking that that would uh, please them in what he had done and that he would be able to release Jesus back to the people and that everything would be just fine and dandy and he would not have to go on about this. We see that scourging during this time was unlawful and wrong because Jesus had done nothing wrong, according to Pilate. He says, I find nothing wrong in this man. But Pilate was in a position underneath a particular leadership that if it got back to him that he did not take care of the situation, that it would not be good for him and his reputation. And so we see that it was unlawful and wrong, but Pilate proceeded with this. And so he was there to satisfy the Jews. And we see here that the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Purple represented a color of leadership, of authority, of royalty. If you had purple on, People bow down to you. But it was not in this sense that they put it. They were mocking him in this sense here. And so we see that they put a, a, a crown of thorns. Uh, rose bushes are very pretty. But they hurt. We all agree. Okay? And so we see here that a crown of thorns. Basically they took a rose bush and pretty much stripped it of the flowers and pretty much made this into a crown of thorns. It could have been a rose bush, could have been a different type of bush, but if we get an illustration of what a rose bush is, we see that these thorns were even longer than a rose bush. These thorns were such of this manner here instead of something that is small. And so they made a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. Well, what does that do? Well, when that is pushed down and beaten down like it says that they did, it pierces the scalp and then blood starts pouring down the face. Uh, I don't know, they pierced into the temples. Where do most headaches start? In the temples, right? And so when their pain is pushed into the temple, it not only causes blood, but also causes physical pain. So we can just see the physical pain that Jesus went through here. And so they basically did whatever they wished or whatever they wanted to with him. Uh, they showed him throughout this scourging. Uh, John doesn't go in much detail, but in the, in the scriptures of Matthew and Mark and those and Luke, we see that the, the, uh, during this process that the, show, the soldiers would show, the, they would blindfold or put a cover over the individual's face during this time of scourging, and they would show him their fist. Okay, They would say, this is my fist. Or they'd play a game. Each soldier would show him the fist. And then all of a sudden, they would punch him in the face. And they'd take the blindfold off and make them guess at who was doing this. And so they were having fun with him. And they were having fun with our Lord Jesus. And so uh, they were be he was beaten to a uh, point to where he was not recognized. And so if we look at Isaiah 52, verse 14, the Scripture tells us, of such here. And we see that Isaiah was a prophet that told of this occasion. And we see here that he prophesied of this in 52 14 and said, As many were astonished at thee, his business was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. He was beaten 
And he was not even, he was beaten so badly that he was not recognizable. And so they had that fun with him. And so as we look at verse 4, Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring you forth to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. He did this to please those people. Then Jesus came forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto him, Behold, this is the man. This is the man that you presented to me. Now he is not recognizable. And so Pilate said, This is the man. I bring him forth to you. In verse 6 it says, When the chief priests therefore and officials saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I found no fault in him. We see basically at this point in time, the other scriptures tells us that Pilate took the basin of water and washed his hands of this and said, I found no fault in him. If you want him crucified, you take him and crucify him because I do not want this man's blood, this innocent man's blood on my hands. Well, he might have been able to wash it away physically, but the sin that he had committed to this innocent man was where? On his heart. And that could not be washed away by physical water. That can only be washed away by the Lord Jesus Himself. We see an illustration here that He tries to wash away the blood. The sin that we have on our heart, we can't just go take a bath multiple times and it save us or remove the sin in our lives. We can't go through this baptism of water right here and that save us from our sins. It has to be that forgiveness. The forgiveness of sin. The Lord coming to our heart and being our boss and our Savior. He is our Savior. The water doesn't save us. He saves us. And so as we see here that it could not wash away the sins of Pilate. But he says if you want him crucified, you crucify him yourself because I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. He says that he is above God. He is God. But they did not understand and realize that he was a part of God. It says that when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was more afraid. Why was he afraid? Well, Pilate says, I wash my hands of this. But then they say, well, we have a law that says he should die. And we're telling you basically to take care of it. And so we see that Pilate himself heard this and that he was more afraid. And he went again into judgment hall and said unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. He basically says, Who are you? Who are you? And then saith Pilate to him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Pilate stepping in his little position here and trying to get force him to answer him and says, I have power all over you. <laughs> well, I got news for Pilate. He had no power over Jesus at all. And so Jesus answered. And see if this sounds familiar to you. And says, Thou couldst have no power at all against me. He said, You have no power against me at all. Except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Jesus says, you have no power over me at all. The one that has the power gave you the power that you have. God gives power for me. Romans 13, exactly right, Kathy. Power was set in a position by God. To be used by God in this situation. He says, except it was given to you from above, you, that's how you have the power. Therefore, that delivered me unto thee hath greater sin. Jesus is kind of saying, Pilate, the power you have is what has been given to you. But those people that are standing out there have a greater sin than you. And so in verse 12, and he says, And thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Basically, they're telling Pilate here that he wanted to release him. He wanted to get Jesus out of his sight. He didn't find any fault in him. He washed his hands of this and said, if you want him crucified, you do it yourself. He wanted to walk away from the situation. 
But he was forced in this situation here. And it says Pilate went from ruler to politician. He said, well, why do you say that? And I say, well, he went from ruler and making the right choice and letting this man go to politician and playing into the hands of the people that wanted Jesus crucified. He wanted to please them instead of pleasing the wall. Would you all not agree that that's part of America's problem today? Is they're playing politician? They want to please the people instead of doing what is right according to the law of man, but most importantly, the law of God. And that's why we are in the state that we're in today. And so he wanted to satisfy their wants and not satisfy what is lawfully correct. It says, And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbath. What he did is he had his soldiers come out, and at a time of judgment, what they do is they bring a seat out for the ruler. So all the people could see. Well, he had his throne and his seat inside his castle or inside his, uh, his area or his palace. But here, he, there's a seat brought out for the ruler that all can see the decision that is about to be made. And so Pilate had his seat brought out. And so he sat upon his throne here is what it's telling us here. And so this is what it was called, the pavement, but in Hebrew it's called Gabbatha. And so and it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. It was getting close to the Passover. And so whatever decision that had to be made had to be done quickly because evening was come when the Passover was to start. And none of this could happen during that time. And so he brought out Jesus and said, Behold, your king, the king of Jews. This is your king. In verse 15, But they cried out, Away from him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith to them, Shall I crucify your king? This is your king. You are the Jews. This is your king, the king of the Jews. Are you sure you want me to crucify him? The priest's chief answered, We have no king but Caesar. This is the same answer that most people in this world give today. We have no king but ourselves. We have no kings but the world. When they should be saying on the other hand, my king, my lord, my savior, Jesus Christ. That's who they should be saying is their king. If you are here today with Jesus in your heart and as your lord and savior, you'd be saying, my King, my Lord, my Savior. But if you're here without Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are saying the same thing as these folks are saying. We have no King but the world and the ruler of it, which is Satan himself. And so here we see in verse 16, Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. My question to you today is the same one that Pilate laid out to the people. Jesus or Caesar? Jesus or the world? It's your choice. Who do you want to follow? Do you want to follow the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Son of God, the true ruler? of the universe? Or do you want to serve Caesar? The United States of America. The world. Satan. Your choice. I don't know about you, but I'd like to be on this side. Because I've read the rest of the story, if you know what I mean. And I know the rest of the story. And I know what happens on this side. And I know what happens on this side. I don't want to be on this side. This side will be defeated at the end. This side will be victorious. And I hope today that if you're on this side, you come to this side before it's too late. The side of Jesus. 
And so as we see here, that in the Scriptures it tells us that they led him away. Matthew 12.30 tells us in God's Word, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Sadly, in churches today, across America, many are scattered abroad. And that's an example of it today. Here in our own church. If people are with Jesus... They're here worshiping and praising and learning about Jesus today. If they are scattered abroad, they are part of the world, as Jesus tells us here in chapter 12, verse 30. If you're not of me, you're scattered abroad doing your own business. And Jesus says that we are here to do the business of the Father, not the business of ourselves. And so as we look at the Scriptures in verse 16, Then He was delivered to them, and He was crucified, and they took Jesus and led Him Away. Let him away to the cross. In verse 17, and he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the school, which is called in Hebrew Galgotha. Sent to the cross. A mercy seat where God extended his mercy. To you and to me. God demonstrated His own love for us. And that He sent His one and only Son. That whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. What a perfect illustration of God's love. And His mercy that was sent down for us. A place where a holy and a righteous God can reach down and save sinners like you and me. The cross is a bridge. From all sinners to eternal life. And without that cross, there is no eternal life. There is no sacrifice for sin that was paid for the last time. Judgment here on the cross changed to mercy. Christ bore my judgment. He bore your judgment. I should have been on that cross. The nail should have been pierced through my hands and my wrist here or my feet. The crown of thorns should have been on my head. The pain and suffering that he took should have been on me, not on him. But because he loved me so much, he said, not my will, but your will be done, as he cried out in the garden. He said, God, I love them so much that I'm willing to do this for them. And that he paid that sacrifice for you and for me. And as we see through this, that the Father was well pleased with His Son. The Savior made Himself an offering for you and for me. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, Who in His own self were our sins? In His own body on the tree. He threatened not. It means he laid it down. He gave it. Up. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed. You were healed because of his stripes. The beating he took on the cross. The whippings that he took. John doesn't give much description of the cross here. We're going to talk about it here in just a minute. 
But if you look at the other scriptures and the other books, it tells us that he was beaten with a cat of nine tails. And a cat of nine tails was a such of an instrument that was gruesome when it was used. It had metal, it had glass tied into the ends of it. And whenever it would rip into the flesh, it basically tore the flesh of the body. And so the stripes were cut. They were deep. It was very painful. He was not hit once, but he was hit multiple times with that cat of nine tails. And his blood poured out. Not many of us could have taken that and lived. But he did. Because he loved you. And he loved me. It says in verse 18, where they, where they crucified him and two others with him on other, either side, one and Jesus in the middle. And Pilate wrote a title and put on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of his people many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city which it was near. And written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate write not the king of Jews but he said I am the king of Jews. They said I don't want you to write that up there. Because they just denied Christ didn't they? They didn't want that written up on his cross that he was the king of Jews. They didn't want anything to do with him or associate with him. So they tried to go back to Pilate and say, please remove that off. They didn't say please. They said remove that off. I don't want that up there. It's very interesting what Pilate says here. And he says, and he answered, what I have written, I have written. It's done. I have written it and that's the way it's going to be. We see an illustration in Latin here of law versus order. We see here where it says in Hebrew that it means religion. In Greek it means culture. Education. It means that it's done. It is written what I've written. Then it loaded the soldiers when I had crucified, when had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part. And also in his coat, now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They took his garment and they ripped it into four pieces. And they took his outer coat. They wanted to rip it, but it couldn't be ripped because it was made out of one full piece. And it says here that they said therefore among themselves, let us not render it, for cast lots for it. Who it shall be that the Scriptures might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my remnant among them. And for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. And if we look at John in Psalms chapter 22, it describes exactly what the soldiers are doing. The Old Testament describes what is going on right before that. Scripture. It says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Can you imagine the anguish, the hurt, the sorrow that's going on in the heart of Mary? The mother of Jesus was standing right before him. disciple standing by whom he loved and that is John that he's talking about here 
And he said unto him, Mother, to his mother, he said, Woman. We might see that Jesus, in other scriptures, he calls his mother woman. Today, that is considered disrespect. But then, back then, during this time, it was a way of respect. And Jesus, showing respect towards his mother, says, Woman, behold thy son. In that time, we see a transition on the cross of Jesus giving his life. He looks at John and he says, Behold, thy mother, mother, thy son. Jesus is saying that I am giving you, John, the responsibility to take care of my mother. And from that day forward, Mary lived in the house of John until she passed. John, the faithful disciple, took care of Jesus' mother for the rest of her life. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has given us a commandment. He says, Go be therefore all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He talks about that in Matthew. That is a commandment that He's given each and every one of us to do. Where he said, John, take care of my mother. Jesus is saying, go and share the good news. Go and tell other people about me. Why would we not want that to be a part of our everyday life living? Is to live according to what Jesus has called us to do. To obey Him. As we see the separation here from His mother. Then saith He to the disciple, Behold thy mother. From that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were not now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, he saith, I thirst. As he sees the importance of fulfilling the Scriptures as it is written, according to the will of the Father. We see another perfect example and illustration of Jesus going about His Father's business and doing as His Father has told. Wanting to fulfill the purpose in every single way. In every detail. Jesus could have missed this detail of the Scriptures and not many people would notice. But to fulfill... The Scriptures, as God has written it to be fulfilled in the Old Testament, Jesus was all about, all the way down to the smallest detail. He gives us every detail to follow and to live by. Some people might say, oh, that's just a small little detail. Nobody would even notice. But i got news for you. If people know that you're a born-again believer... They're watching every move you make. Even from the smallest detail to the largest detail. They may not care. But who do you think cares? God the Father. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest thing going on in TV nowadays is what? Reality shows, right? Because they have a camera pointed right on them. I don't know if you know it, but you have a camera pointed on you every day. And that's God the Father. Jesus is watching. He's watching to protect you. But He's also watching over you. He wants you to follow to the smallest detail so that others can be led to Him. It says, Now when they were set a vessel full of vinegar, they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop. Hyssop's kind of like a, a piece of bamboo if you would it's similar to that. And put it in his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. A small detail had to be done before he could give it up. It says, And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And
Verse 31, it says, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross of the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was approaching. They had to get the body down. For that Sabbath day was a high day, but sought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and that the other which was crucified with him. When they came to Jesus, say that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Some might say, well, why is it, why is it important that they break his leg? Well, when you break the legs, it sped up the process of death. So they had to break the legs because the Sabbath was coming. They had to get things finished and taken care of. Had to get these men off the cross. If it wasn't the Sabbath approaching, they'd have just left them there and let them die on their own. It would not have sped up the process. But it says, but one of the soldiers with the spear, we see that Jesus came to Jesus and Jesus is already dead because Scripture tells us in verse 30, he gave up the ghost and it was finished. And so they didn't break his legs. But if we look at it in the Old Testament Scripture, guess what? It was another fulfillment of prophecy where his legs were not to be broken. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out of blood and water. Shows another illustration that he was dead because water was coming out of the side. And he that saith it bear record, and the record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. We're talking about John here. He wrote this. So that you might believe in the Son of God. That you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And that He came and He died for you as it talks about and prophesies about. This was fulfillment of prophecy, John is saying. That you might believe in the Son of God that gave His life on that cruel, cruel cross for you. For these things were done and the Scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of Him shall not be broken. And we see that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. We also see that in Numbers 9, 12, and Psalms 34, 20. It's not mentioned once. It's mentioned multiple times to show the importance of this. That the Scriptures are true. In verse 37, and again, another Scripture saith, They shall look on Him whom they have pierced. Revelation 1, 7, Zechariah 12, 10 speaks of this. That they would look upon this man. And that they would relieve, receive him and believe upon him. Verse 38. As we look back at the cross, we see the gospel being presented to us. Verse 38. And after this, Joseph from Arimathea began being a disciple of Jesus 